Kareen. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you heard, I did just finish briefing President Biden um, on the impacts that we are expecting to see from Hurricane Helene. And as I told him, uh, we have been preparing for this storm for a number of days, and we began moving resources into Florida on Monday. I just want everybody to know that this is going to be a multi-state event with the potential for significant impacts from Florida all the way to Tennessee. And the President wants to make sure that everyone is paying attention to the potential life-threatening impacts that this storm may bring. And he has directed me to travel there tomorrow to assess the impacts. Uh, the entire state of Florida is under some type of warning right now, whether that's a hurricane warning or a tropical storm warning. Um, and we expect life-threatening flash flooding in the state's north as the storm continues to move north. And so I need everybody to pay attention to their local officials. They're going to have the best information on the specific risks where you are at. We're already seeing impacts in Florida, and the forecast indicates that we could see up to 20 feet of storm surge. So just think back two years ago to Hurricane Ian. The peak storm surge from that was 14 feet, and we saw the amount of destruction, and 150 people lost their lives, the majority of them from drowning. So please take this threat from storm surge seriously. Residents that are in these areas, they can still take action. They can take action now to move out of harm's way. And remember that you may only need to go 10 or 15 miles inland to get away from the threat of the storm surge itself because water is the number one reason that we see people lose their lives in these storms. So please don't underestimate what the impacts could possibly be. So at the President's direction, um, we have over 1,100 personnel so far across the federal government supporting um, the preparedness efforts for this storm. We also have an additional 700 personnel from FEMA that are already in these states supporting other disasters that we can quickly pivot to support any of the response needs as needed. Some of the resources that we have already deployed include eight search and rescue teams across Florida and Georgia, as well as resources from the Coast Guard, the Department of Defense, to immediately support any life-saving um, operations as needed. Now, the Army Corps of Engineers has power restoration teams and debris specialists who are going to be able to help restore power and support debris removal operations as soon as it is safe to do so. We have health and medical task forces from Health and Human Services to evaluate the impacts to medical facilities. We have food, water, generators, and tarps that are deployed to staging locations across the region, and so they are easily accessible and movable post-storm. And the Red Cross is actively standing up shelters in areas um, that are expected to see and feel the impacts from Helene. My regional administrator is currently embedded in the Florida Emergency Operations Center as well as incident management assistance teams in Florida, Georgia, and Alabama, and we have one currently moving to North Carolina today so we can ensure seamless communications between the federal government and the needs of the states. I'm very grateful, as you heard, President Biden um, quickly approved pre-landfall declarations for Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina. And this allows us to immediately provide any of that life-saving support in the coming days. And I'm grateful for the rest of the federal family that is there on the ground working with us side by side as we pre uh, prepare to support the American people for what is to come over the next several days. Uh, I just want everybody to know that the Biden-Harris administration, we are ready for this event. We have aggressively pre-deployed resources. We are postured for whatever response might be needed. And so let me just say one more time before I take any questions. Take if you want to learn about prepping. Seriously. People in Hurricane Helene's path, you need to listen to your local officials. If they tell you to evacuate, please do so. And if they tell you to shelter in place, then that's what you should do. They're going to give you the best information that you can do um, for your specific situation. Those decisions can save lives. And with that, then I'll take questions. Thanks, Dan. So this is likely to be the 21st billion dollar weather or climate disaster this year. So does FEMA have the resources to keep on responding to disaster after disaster like this? So we have absolutely enough resources to continue to support the life-saving response that we need to for this event. 
Um, I think everybody's aware that we went into immediate needs funding um, as our disaster relief fund, the, the funding was running low. But the reason we do that is to make sure we have enough money for an event just like this. And so I want everybody to know that we have exactly what we need and there are no limitations to our ability to support the response for this disaster. As we continue to go through the recovery though for all of these disasters, that also takes personnel. And we're gonna continue to work through with our states about what they need and how we can best adjudicate those resources. But we are seeing an increase and we're seeing a strain on our staff with um, more of them deployed for longer periods of time helping to support these communities recover. And just also related to the, the money here, um, some pretty substantial losses projected in terms of the crop insurance, in terms of the flood insurance. Um, is there, and there's no new money in the CR um, uh, as far as this is concerned, is there any expectation that you're gonna have to go back with a supplemental request? So we yeah, so we did put a supplemental request in um, with the CR. It does not give us a supplemental at this time, um, but it gives us the ability to spend the money that was put forth in the president's budget. Um, but we're already, uh, through INF, $9 billion, close to $9 billion in projects that we have put on hold that we can't reimburse communities for. Once uh, we lift INF and once the CR um, goes into effect, we'll be able to pay those. Um, but without a supplemental, we'll, we will be back in INF um, probably in the January timeframe. Um, can you talk more about how widespread you think prolonged power outages will be and what those power restoration teams are doing to prepare? Is there anything they can do proactively you know, before the storm? So Florida has a really robust plan and they have really aggressive targets to try to get the majority of people, um, I forget what the exact percentage is, I think it was 85 or 90% within 48 hours back up. And they have several thousand resources that have been pre-positioned to come in and support Florida Power and Light or the other um, utilities to help them get the power back on. Uh, we expect widespread power outages from this. When we think about Tallahassee, it's got a lot of tree canopy. So those trees are gonna come down and impact those power lines and the debris and the ability to detangle the debris from the power lines is what could take a long time. The power restoration teams, they do a couple of things from the Army Corps. One, they can help us put generators in on critical facilities to help um, make sure that those facilities have power, but they can also make assessments on how to prioritize some of the work so we know where we need to put our efforts to help the, the private sector pri uh, utility companies get the power restored as quickly as possible. Um, could you talk a little bit about how the response has changed based on the severity of the storms? I think we're seeing an increasing um, uh, storms with increasing severity. So how does that change the response for you? I mean, I know it's more manpower, but what, what else? How else does it change? I think the biggest thing is that we want to get things in place early. This is why we've been moving resources into the area since Monday and having, we know there's a large population that's really vulnerable in Florida. And so that's why we have so many search and rescue teams that are able to come in and augment the really Im um, impressive amount of teams that Florida already has within the state, right? So this is on top of what they already have. And so for us, it's making sure that we are sending more than we think that we'll need. And if I don't need them, I can send them home. What I don't wanna do is be short. I wanna make sure that I have enough that can support whatever the states might request said that you are headed down there tomorrow. Did you discuss with the president um, whether uh, it might be possible for him to make the trip down in the coming days? And um, secondly, is there a single piece of advice or warning that you wish in these kinds of situations people would heed more seriously that you might want to emphasize in this setting? Yeah, so the purpose of my visit is to assess the impacts, and I'll be briefing him on what those impacts are. I'll leave it to Kareen to talk with him about what you know actions he might take. But I think the the message is take this seriously. I mean, we look at the cone, and the cone is the wind, but the water is what kills people. And so we need to really look at where this storm surge is going to be in Florida, but Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and those Appalachians, they're gonna have up to 20 inches of rain in an area that can have significant flash flooding, and that is really life-threatening, and it comes so much faster than what we see from a storm surge, right? They're gonna have less warning once the rain starts there. So they need to know what they're gonna do now, put those plans, uh, plans in place today for where they're gonna go, how they're gonna contact 
um, their family and their friends, what they're going to need to take with them, like medicine or power devices for medical reasons. It's not too late. They should be able to put those plans together today so they can take the actions that their local officials tell them to do. Uh, talking about the need to follow evacuation orders if local officials give them. We know from past storms that people don't always heed that, not because they don't want to, but because they can't afford to leave the area, don't have anywhere to go, don't have family members to help them. Is FEMA doing anything to work on that particular issue, given what you're talking about um, with water and the danger that can come from that if people stay in place? Yeah, so part of the pre-landfall emergency declaration is specifically to reimburse states and local jurisdictions for any of the costs that they incur to do sheltering and evacuation because we want them to have the resources to put in place whatever measures that they need. I think the important thing on the evacuation to remember is if you're told to evacuate, especially from the storm surge area, it doesn't mean you have to go to a whole other state. And I think we, we often think of those pictures of contraflow lines and, and backed up traffic. Um, but you really sometimes only need to go a few miles to get out of harm's way. And so the local officials should be able to tell you where there's local evacuation centers that you can go to until the threat of the storm has passed. And then when we get to the point where if they are displaced, then we have the long-term sheltering um, concerns that we'll have to work with. But the initial sheltering concern is just getting out of this storm's path for right now. Then we can work on what those long-term needs are. And that's why the pre-landfall declaration is so incredibly important that the president approved, is to make sure that those states have the resources to stand up those shelters and to help people get to safety. And do you feel that the state is ready to stand up those shelters? I mean, you're talking about how you're going to reimburse them, but is Florida ready to do that? Florida has stood up many shelters, uh, and the American Red Cross is also there supporting that. I just need people to evacuate and go to them. Okay, we'll wrap it up. Go ahead, John. Thanks, Kareen. Uh, what resources are available, not only to families, but also to small business in the aftermath of this storm uh, making landfall? Resources coming not only from FEMA, but also from the SBA. Yeah, there's a number of programs that are available. Um, for FEMA, we specifically made some changes into uh, our disaster declaration, the Stafford Act, recently, which allows people that work from home to actually get compensated for some of their business losses if they work from home, like if they had a computer or other equipment that they needed to do their personal, if they're a photographer and they lost their cameras. Um, so we just made that change recently in March to be able to compensate um, small business owners that work from home. Um, SBA can speak specifically about their programs, um, but they've also made some really um, amazing changes this year, which increases the dollar amount that people can borrow from the SBA. It extends the time where they're going to uh, delay the interest until they have to pay it or to start to repay that loan. And it's a tremendous resource to really help small businesses get back on their feet. And how did you decide where to position yourself tomorrow with the storm uh, making landfall? So we're looking at where we think the biggest impact is going to be, and right now it looks like it's a, a dead-on hit to Tallahassee. And so we'll fly as close to Tallahassee as we can get, and then I'll meet up with the governor and his team so I can see what the impacts are, hear what the, the team is thinking, and then we will assess, right? I've got staff on the ground that will have the intel as to where the hardest hit areas are. And then typically we like to either get an aerial view so I can fly over and see what some of those damages are, um, or on the ground if need be. Um, but I'm also prepared to move up to Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, as we start to see what those impacts are and assess that. And because me being on the ground helps me validate some of the damages more quickly so we can get major declarations in place faster. Okay. Last question. Thank you. Um, at the start of this year, you rolled out reforms to cut some of the red tape for the individual assistance program. Um, now that so many people are in the path of this storm, can you give an update on how quickly you expect survivors to be able to tap into that given those changes that were put in effect more than six months ago at this point. Yeah, we've seen some really tremendous positive impact from the changes that we have made. In fact, one of the changes we made was we decoupled the requirement to apply for an SBA loan in order to be eligible for our programs. And it's really saving people several days um, in the process. And we're getting a large number of people that wouldn't have come back to us, which is great. 
Um, we're also seeing people get funding quicker, right? We have uh, serious needs assistance um, that can get them a very small amount of money to help with some of their immediate costs, um, but also the individual and households program that can help them with if they're underinsured. And so it really all depends on what their specific need is. The money that they will see the fastest um, typically is that initial $750. Um, any damages to their home, um, we still have to assess and see what those damages are um, and then can make that determination. But we have teams that go right out in the field, they can register them in the field, and that really helps to speed up the process. Okay, all right, thank you so much. Thank you, Karine. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.